I'm very pleased and honoured to speak in the same forum as Wang Shudong. Um, we work very closely with the Dunhuang Academy. And today I'm going to talk a bit about the sort of complementary work, if you like, that goes on alongside the work of the Dunhuang Academy, the International Dunhuang Project. But I want to raise some questions in this talk. I'll give an overview of the talk, a bit of an overview of Dunhuang, but I want to, along the way, raise some questions. Um, and specifically, I want to start by looking how we got from here. This is the Dunhuang Caves in 19, um, 1907 to here, the exhibition on today um, in this, in this centre, and where are we going to go in the future? And I think it's a perfectly reasonable question that the gentleman here asked about why digitise, and I can give you a very specific answer for about why we digitised, but I'll come to that. And what are the obstacles on the way in, uh, for the future? Let me just give you a bit of history first, because although you've heard lots about Dunhuang, and I always assume everybody knows all about it, but I understand that many of you come from many different backgrounds, many different cultures, and you're not all Silk Road historians like me, so it isn't at the forefront of your minds. Well, OK, let's go back uh, 2,000 years to the opening of the great trade routes uh, from Central Asia, north, south, to India, and to the steppe, and east, west, along to, to Africa, the Near East, and Europe, and to China, that sort of radiated out from Central Asia and opened up or formed, if you like, a global world in a pre-global age. If we're looking at the area of what is now Western China, and Xinjiang and Gansu provinces, around the Taklamakan Desert, the Gobi and the, the Lop and the Gobi Deserts, um, the trade routes went through the oases north and south um, of this area, as you can see here in a very basic diagram. And Dunhuang was at a point where routes that went through the Lop Desert and north and south sort of joined. So it was at a very important point, sort of on the borders of China proper, if you like. Um, very important point for the merchants, the monks, the envoys, the diplomats who, who went there from 2,000 years ago, travelled these routes. Of course, this was also the time when Buddhism was starting to travel, or was enabled to travel, um, northward from its home in northern India and through into Gandhara, what is now sort of Pakistan and Afghanistan, and then following these trade routes, going along with the, with the um, monks, with the merchants, um, into the Tarim Basin and along the Taklamakan. Okay, here, and thence into China. Now, of course, in India, we have um, cave temples in early Buddhism, places like Ajantra, Laura, many other sites. Um, we have uh, cave temples, of course, in other religions in India as well. The, the building of temples in um, as caves, excavating caves out of cliffs, um, was a tradition in India, or became a tradition. They were built to replicate freestanding structures with architectural um, designs, features inside, such as these pillars. And this technique, um, this practice, this architectural form, travelled along the Silk Road from India, and you get these forms in India, onto, well, obviously through, through Gandhara, and um, onto the Northern Silk Road. And so you get cave sites all the way along the Tarim Basin and Northern Taklamakan, mainly on the north side because of the um, geography is better for, um, for building of caves. Uh, this is at a place called Kizil um, near Kuchar. And this is Bezaklik near Turafan. And just a point of here, we've Concentrating here on Dunhuang, which is a very famous, very well protected, very well managed site, thanks to Dunhuang Academy. But of course, there are many, many cave sites um, that have that are less well preserved. Some of them that don't have necessarily the funds or the management or the attention. And we mustn't forget when we're talking about concentrating on one site that there's still all these other sites that we work on. And I should say that IDP, the International Dunhuang Project, despite its name, actually covers all these areas as well. We cover the whole of the Taklamakan. So this is Bezaklik near Turafan, um, caves here along the cliff face, and then of course Dunhuang. So cave. The making of cave temples, Buddhist cave temples, family caves, caves built by guilds of merchants, caves built by the rulers of Dunhuang, 
to um, to 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 um, as a Buddhist act of piety um, became um, became common in this area. And at Dunhuang, as we've heard, over a thousand years from about 400 to 1400, there were um, over 700 caves excavated from this cliff face at various times. Sometimes the uh, old caves were renovated and rebuilt and expanded and painted over. So in some caves, we have several layers of paintings, sculptures. This is a very friable cliff face, as you can see. It's not stone. It's not possible to sculpt in stone from it. So the sculptures are um, in clay with a, a wooden base um, skeleton or um, straw skeleton, uh, and then with clay and plaster and painted. The friable cliff face, of course, makes it very vulnerable to erosion um, over time. So after 1400, uh, it continued to be in use, but really wasn't the thriving site that it once had been. And as Wong mentioned, by 1900, there was a resident monk there. There was an annual festival when lots of monks actually came across uh, um, from Tibet. Um, there was still activity there, but it was very little activity, and a lot of the caves just lay in disrepair, unused, um, and long forgotten. Um, we've seen some pictures of the caves, as said, following the tradition, the Vihara cave, the Chaya caves from, um, Stupa caves from India, um, and we saw this cave in a 3D technology, and there's a cave which you, with a central pillar which you can circumambulate around. Okay, so that's what happened, 1400. Let's jump forward to about the 1890s when these caves were sitting in quite an outpost of uh, the Chinese Empire. This was the, close to the end of um, Imperial China. 1911 was a revolution. There wasn't a lot of ten attention in central China at that time to the outposts of Western China, to Dunhuang. So it wasn't an area, well, culture wasn't an area of concern at that point. There were lots of political concerns. So this, um, Dunhuang was um, just lying in the desert, as said, with some attention, some monks. Um, a lot of the front of the cliff, as you can see here, had sheared off just by uh, wind, sand, um, rain floods because it's, it's an extremely friable cliff. And all these caves, these caves that you can see here, would have originally had an antechamber in front, and that's just completely disappeared. It's just completely collapsed. So they're very open to the element. Sand blows in from the top where the sand dunes scouring the caves. So very vulnerable. Along comes this man, and this is a very potted short history, okay? There's lots of detail there, but not time to go into it. Uh, Wang Daolu, who happens, in fact, not to be a Buddhist monk, but a Taoist monk, but is wandering around, um, itinerant monk, and decides, happens upon the site of Mogao, uh, Dunhuang, this cave site, and is inspired to make it his life's work to settle there, to go out to collect arms, to collect money, to funds, to work on the conservation and the renovation of the caves. So he, um, he settles there in this house here, which is still in Dunhuang, and goes around trying to raise money from local politicians, from local people, goes on tours, and comes back and renovates the sculptures, mainly, not so much the painting, starts clearing out the caves. And in the course of this, in the course of clearing out this cave, which was filled with sand sort of up to here, um, he happens upon a hidden doorway. It was plastered over and painted. You can just see the edge of it here. Uh, and he gets his workmen to clear out the sand, to, to clear out the plaster, and he founds a little doorway inside, which led to a small cave, which had been built in the, um, in the 8th and uh, 9th century as a um, memorial cave to this monk, Hongbian who was abbot of Dunhuang at the time. And you see the painting on the back of the cave, the statue of the monk, and then there was a memorial tablet giving this monk's um, works and his achievements. Now, the statue had long been moved out when Wang Daolu happened upon it. This cave was no longer used as a memorial chapel. It had been filled, um, and here's a picture showing the chapel off the side of the cave. It had been filled floor to ceiling with manuscripts, printed documents, the earliest printed documents in the world, paintings um, on hemp and silk. Um, reasons are, there's various theories put forward, but it was certainly, um, 
in some sense made up of library items and sacred waste from the surrounding monasteries. And in its heyday, there were over a dozen monasteries in, in the vicinity of Dunhuang, including one on the um, valley floor below the, below the caves. Mainly um, scrolls in Chinese, such as this one here, some of them in very, very fine condition because they'd been, um, oh, I should say the cave was, it was thought that, and it is thought that it was sealed, filled with these objects in the 10th century and sealed about 1000 AD, and then rediscovered in 1900 by this monk. So it lay in there for 900 years. Um, the manuscripts were in the position, in the same, um, state as they were put into the cave, which was in some cases very good, in some cases very poor. It just depended how much they'd been handled in their lifetime. Um, but they hadn't deter didn't seem as if they deteriorated a lot in the caves. It's typical Chinese scroll, but you have a lot of Tibetan poti and, in fact, um, little booklets. This is very nice. Um, Lotus Sutra, I like this picture because I think it's one of the earliest pictures of childbirth. Here you go. This is a couple. Um, appealing to um, the Bodhisattva of Avalokiteshvara for a child. And in fact, I mean, in Hong Kong, there are still shrines to Avalokiteshvara who's in the interim become female. Here is Bodhisattva, so male. Um, Guan Yin, Guan Xian, um, and shrines for, for childless couples. So here we see a tradition carrying on all the way up to the present day. And here the couple are, well, here the woman is, Julie giving birth um, nine months later after her appeals have been heard. But lots of little booklets like this. It would have been probably a little private copy for someone. It's just a tiny little piece um, booklet like this size. Um, so showing the development of the book in over 15 languages and scripts, so showing the cultural diversity of Dunhuang. Although Chinese is the main language and then Tibetan, um, because Dunhuang was ruled by the Tibetan Empire from about 750 to 850, um, to, um, Tibetan is second language. Paintings, as I said, very, very fine paintings like this on silk, showing um, Bodhisattva leading a deceased up to the Pure Land. Um, yeah, and um, wonderful, wonderful material. Instead, some of the earliest dated printed documents in the world. So, cave was discovered, 1900. Wang Daolu, the monk, started using some, he moved the stuff out of the cave, looked through it, put it back in, took some of the finest paintings and some of the finest scrolls and went around locally to local officials to try to get support for his work on conserving. So some of the material dispersed out and it still comes onto the market today. Um, not much, but a little bit. But the remainder was kept in the cave, and this was the age of imperial archaeology in this region following the end of the Great Game, the rapprochement between Britain and China. It became a region that was safe for foreigners to go to. There was great interest because it was seen to be lost cities, lost civilizations in the sands of the Taklamakhan, and all the imperial powers of the time um, funded expeditions out there, archaeological expeditions. Um, and among them was was um, this man here, seen with his dog, Dash, Oral Stein, Hungarian-born, British natu uh, naturalized um, scholar, Indo-Iranian scholar, who went on four expeditions to Chinese Central Asia uh, between 1900 and 1930. But in 1907, well, 1906, he was at Dunhuang doing excavations in the north in the um, defensive walls from, um, from the Han Dynasty, and then came back to the town and heard of this find. And he went to the caves and, for a small sum of money, acquired a large number of manuscripts, which were then sent um, to the then British Museum, manuscripts and paintings, and later divided between the British Museum, the India office, who were also funding his expeditions, and so many, some objects are now in India. And the British Museum objects um, were divided, um, the manuscripts, came to, became part of the collections of the British Library when the British Library was founded in 1972. That was 1907. 1908, the great French sinologist was there, Paul Pellio, and you see him here sitting in the cave with the gap left after Stein had taken the manuscripts, and you get an idea of how jam-packed the cave was with manuscripts. Um, you can see the 
Tibetan poti down here, and a candle. <gasps> History could have been so different. <laughs> One false move, and that would have been it. Um, I should say it's serendipity of history as well. If we just go back to Stein, he was actually, when he um, acquired all these manuscripts for his um, silver coins, he put them all in crates and he was going to store them locally in the local magistrate's office, but he decided, because there was a bit of unrest, to take them up to the next town and store them there while he went on further expeditions um, up to the north um, north and east, and it was fortunate because after he left Dunhuang, there was a local riot and the magistrate's office was burnt down. So, again, saved for history. But this is what we have to remember when looking at these objects, that what we have is accidents. What we've lost, we can never know. Um, so we just have to try to work with what we have, but assume that nothing is ever safe and there is no total place of safekeeping. Just a picture showing, as I said, showing Pelio in the cave, and you can see um, the picture here, the painting on the back wall from the original cave. So, to cut a long story short, after Pelio, the Chinese in 1909-1910 central government sent an expedition to um, acquire the rest of the manuscripts in the cave and bring them back to, to Beijing. Um, Chinese manuscripts, the Tibetan, were left in situ. Um, but whether Wang Daolu secreted some away or whether there were forgeries, and there were certainly forgeries, um, Russian and Japanese expeditions, when they went there in the following few years, also acquired more, found and acquired more manuscripts. And Stein went back also um, on, his, on his third Central Asian expedition. This means that, as Wong said, the contents of the library cave are now dispersed in collections worldwide. And this is the sort of, I guess, the major collections, but there are many, many smaller collections and some private collections. But this would represent 95%, I guess, of the cave's contents. Um, all the ones, um, the ones marked in red are ones we're, we're currently negotiating MOUs with, and the ones marked in black are all ones that are collab um, collaborating partners on IDP. So you can see the material was dispersed. Um, of course, China was in 20th century, early Chinese history is not a period of, of peace and, and stability. There was lots going on. Um, so the caves weren't at the forefront, but they became more and more prominent, especially with visits such as the famous um, literatus and painter Zhang Daqian, shown here in the caves with his students making tracings of the paintings which he later showed in Beijing. And as Wong said, the Dunhuang Art Institute was founded, which later became the Dunhuang Academy, and there became a serious program of actually looking after and restoring the caves. Also, we've heard about how in the 1980s, the late 1980s, the Getty Conservation Institute got involved and started work first on stabilizing the site along with the Dunhuang Academy and then on doing um, more work on conservation of caves. And this work, of course, continues and will continue time immemorial. Whether these caves will disappear uh, or whether they will continue in the physical, I hope that physically, the physical art, um, will continue that it won't disappear, even though I said there's no place of safekeeping, and then conservators like this will always have slow, painstaking task to perform, and this will carry on, as I said, as long as there's caves. So work started in the late 1980s, early 1990s with collaboration, and this is the time we started IDP because with the fall of the Soviet Union and um, Soviet bloc in 1989, it was the first time really we were able to talk to colleagues in Russia, um, or, uh, or to talk meaningfully and co colleagues in Russia who had collections. And we'd been building up links with colleagues in China, of course, over the 80s. So in 1993, we had a conference in London to pull together all the curators and conservators from all the major collections of Dunhuang manuscripts. And it was decided to set up IDP with its directorate at the British Library, but very much an international collaboration of all the partners. 
And the aim was always to increase access to this material while ensuring its preservation for future generations. This was 1993. Internet was just starting. I went along and said, oh, we could put them on the internet. And everybody looked at me as if I was crazy. And now you're all sitting here expecting fantastic 3D stuff on the internet. But um, we, we started working um, with funding in 1994, and I should say we've always been an externally funded project and always been a very small project. We have a very small team who just work very, very hard. Um, but it was always about ensuring access and preservation. If you ask me why we did digitization, it's because we wanted to make this material available in one place to scholars who, um, and digitization was feasibly the only way to do that. Previously, they had to travel, maybe even to see one manuscript was um, split between different collections and they'd have to travel between Russia, maybe in China and the UK just to study one manuscript. Uh, and there were very, very limited publications and everything. So it was very, very much about ensuring preservation. But of course, as soon as you start creating a digital heritage, I come, I'm a historian, I'm a curator of a collection, and I'm very well aware that we're doubling our workload, because now we're not only having to preserve the physical objects, we're having to preserve the digital. And whether we, the digital is any more stable than the physical, I would say it's a lot less so at the moment. Having been involved in digital world since 1993, I have seen perhaps, certainly during the 90s and early 2000s, Oh, perhaps 90% of the projects I, I've, um, that I've seen presented at conferences no longer exist. Their data no longer exists, and data is still exceedingly vulnerable, and it's exceedingly expensive to look after. Um, I'm sure that will change because there's a lot at stake for digital data, but we're not quite there yet, and we mustn't forget that. It's all very well to rush headlong into creating things, but we have to think about how to preserve them as well. Otherwise, there's little point. We should better spend our funds preserving the original objects. Um, conservation is still very much at the heart of IDP, physical conservation. And just to show, we have a YouTube channel with videos on, for example, showing um, some of the conservation work. We have conservation conferences between all our partners. We work on a multilingual conservation glossary. Um, and we all work together to think of the best techniques for pre preserving this material. So that's ongoing work that carries on. But as I said, it was very much about access as well and access on the web. And since this is a conference on design, I show this even though I look at it now and think, because oh, this was our first website that went online in 1998. And it looks terrible now, doesn't it? But there you go. It was 1998, a long time ago. But another thing to be said, of course, as soon as you have a website, you have a child that needs constantly looking after and clothing and feeding and taking to the hospital and everything. And that child never grows up and leaves home. It's just always there. Um, and this is a very expensive task as well. So 1998, 2000, um, 2001, um, we redesigned, and then we redesigned again in about 2006 with the website we have now. Um, we do this in-house. We have a designer and me. That's, you know, we don't have a team of people. We don't have funds for a team of people. We just do it ourselves. It means we're very agile and very flexible, but we don't get much sleep. Um, and we're just going through a big redesign now of the back and front end, because this now looks to us very old and very jaded and is overdue for a redesign. Um, again, we have no funds for that, but we have a child to look after. We have a responsibility, so we can't just um, leave him or her. Is a website female or male? That's an interesting one, isn't it? I don't know. I'll have to think about that um, to suffer. So this is the English language website. Um, oh, I should say, there was a question earlier about users and how we got their feedback. We do a lot of feedback from users in various ways, but we're just carrying out a user survey over this year. It's gone live in English, and we're about to send it out to Chinese users in Chinese to, to find out, um, get feedback about what they want um, for, um, in the new design. Um, it was always very much part of access um, involves um, having different language, languages for all our partners, and all the partner websites host 
all the partners, IDP partners host websites in their own languages. So um, we have Korean, German, Japanese, French, Russian. Um, what else? I missed one off. I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> English, obviously. And we're about to put up sites also in Turkish, Spanish, and Arabic, so that we sort of reach the parts of the world that um, most parts of the world. And we hope we will stop there, because it's an awful lot of work. Um, so these are the IDP partners now that all host their own websites. And all they all every website serves the same data but the data is synchronized between all the centers and the images are kept on the servers of the host. So if in Russia, the Russian server hosts the uh, Russian images. Now, this doesn't make any difference for the end user unless the Russian server's down, in which case they can't get access to the Russian images. Um, and we did this because of giving autonomy and ownership to, to the partners, making them feel that everyone was an equal partner. But it does involve um, a lot of work for us because uh, but this is, um, we have a website at Dunhuang, just to say, and this is also very much about skill sharing and um, autonomy of partners. This is Abby, um, one of IDP staff at, at Dunhuang, um, doing some training um, about eight years ago or whatever, when we um, set up a digitization centre there. Um, yeah, so these are all the centres, and as I said, um, although it, it's a nice model in the sense that it gives autonomy to the partners and they look after their own servers and everything, it does involve a um, complex model of synchronisation. Oh, sorry. Um, and as the directorate, we look after all of that and have to troubleshoot it all. And so we are now looking to change that model and move more towards, um, so I have to go through that again, um, getting material, getting um, data using APIs and everything from different partners as they move into their own systems. We had to do this at the beginning as well because none of these, none of our partners had their own systems either for their digital data. This was early days. Okay, just to whiz through, um, of course then, this was 1993 IDP was formed, we went online in 1998. As, as Professor Wong has mentioned, um, then the Dunhuang Academy started collaborations with places like Northwestern University. Um, Sarah Fraser, who did her PhD on Dunhuang and then set up this, um, with the Dunhuang Academy, this um, research network and started digitizing the caves with the um, um, team from the um, media unit at Northwestern started doing early digitization and from that um, QTVR 3D modeling. So this was the sort of, if you like, the start of what we see now. Um, this was going on in the early 2000s um, and we've seen how it's come a long way since then. IDP's also come a long way. I should say we, um, we've expanded in scope uh, both content to be digitized and audience, so we deal with not only manuscripts and paintings from Dunhuang, but textiles, archaeological artifacts, paintings and murals from all the sites on the Eastern Silk Road, um, along with all the archaeolog archaeologists' notes, plans, maps, diaries and other expedition archives, all to add context and richness to the data, because it's very much about that. So while we offer um, full images of all the manuscripts with cataloging information and also if they've got things like silk ties we will add information about the silk um, here's a buddhist manuscript we do a lot of paper fiber analysis and other scientific tests and all the results of that will go online alongside the manuscripts um, said expanding in terms of the objects um, that we digitize so these are 3d objects from other sites um, archives is from the British Library, letters from Stein, um, all the photographs, and as well as the historical photographs online, we also are doing more um, photographic documentation um, with the Xinjiang Institute of Archaeology. Um, this is a place called Nia, and setting everything in context. So all the archaeological sites are also there from which these objects were found, and you're able to search from the archaeological site to the object, or go from the object to the archaeological site. Um, and we do a lot of work with um, education, outreach, um, provide a lot of resources, and do work with school children worldwide. 
But our guiding principles, I guess, have stayed constant. And our guiding principles have always been, first and foremost, free access to all. All our data is freely accessible and always has been and always will be. That's a non-given. Whenever we've negotiated MOUs with new partners, it has to be accessible, and we would never compromise on that. Um, and we're now trying to persuade everyone, I'll come back to that, make it more accessible and more reusable. We're very much about quality of data, comprehensiveness, getting everything done, because look, I, I started IDP, I'm a scholar of this material, I wanted to see it, I wanted to have access to it. It's no good having access to selection, you need the whole lot. So, um, and then you need it in context, you need the articles on it, you need the other information, the other places, um, other related data. It's always been collaborative about skill sharing on autonomy and sustainable. And sustainable is, of course, a big factor um, in terms of long-term um, looking after this data. So, just to say, where are we with the digital Dunhuang? Well, metadata images of all the caves. We've heard about how there's now about 50 fantastic work from the Dunhuang Academy over the past 10 years or so, but there's over, well, over 700 caves. Um, there's a long way to go. It's a very expensive, long process. Um, metadata images of all the manuscripts from the library cave from Dunhuang. We have 400,000 images so far on IDP. Um, probably representing about 25,000 out of 40, 50,000 manuscripts from Dunhuang. So we're getting there. We could triple our output tomorrow if we had funding, but we have, in London, we have, for example, one photographer. That's all I have funding for. So the work is slow. And as, um, as we've heard earlier, work of digitizing cultural artifacts is slow. You can't stick them through a book scanner. Each one has to be handled um, separately. Um, Metadata images of all portable paintings from the Dunhuang Library Cave. Well, we've done about 80% of those. The only ones remaining are those in India and a few in private collections. Um, all the ones in the British Museum and the Musée Guimet are done and online. Freely accessible to all. Well, all our material is freely accessible and will be um, freely reusable by all. Well, we're very pleased that the British Library has just agreed to put all the material out under public domain and Creative Commons licences, depending on the nature of the material. So, yes, it is freely reusable now, and we're trying to now persuade, that's British Library material, persuade all our other partners over the next few years to do the same. Um, at the moment, most of them do assert copyright on the material, although the JPEGs online you can download and everybody will allow them for scholarly use. Um, we're also um, putting APIs on IDP data, so you'll be able to pull it up and use it in other applications. So that's very much part of our commitment. But we're on a constant quest. <laughs> this is the thing that slows us down um, through the sands of the Taklamakan um, for funds. And, oh, well, so why does this matter? Well. You know, this generation is wowed by wonderful exhibits here, Digital Dunhuang. Um, but the future generation, well, these are students we did um, at, a, at a workshop we did with the Dunhuang Academy on Chinese astronomy, and here they are dealing with pen and paper. Um, but the next generation are not going to be satisfied with that, nor are they going to be satisfied with what we have here. The next generation are going to want free, personal, immediate, and reusable access to everything uh, without question. Um, and how are we going to do that? Well, everything equals data. We have to create data. We have to look after data. And therefore, heritage data is time and money. And we can talk about cutting edge technology all we like, but we have to consider um, time and money. And we have to consider what our priorities are as heritage practitioners. If I have limited funds, should I be concentrating on conserving the original manuscripts or digitizing them? I don't want to have to make that decision. I think it's not so straightforward anyway, but it is a question we have to um, ask ourselves. Um, so, why does it matter? Well, of course, 
it matters, it matters that we create data for this next generation. Um, and it matters that next generation get this and get interested in it because they're the generation that are going to be looking after carrying on our work. Without their interest, without their commitment, there's going to be no future generation to look after these sites and to look after the data created. And I hope that um, with IDP we play a small part in ensuring the, the interest of the future generation and ensuring the preservation both of the physical and the digital heritage of Dunhong. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Excellent project, of course. I have actually three questions, yeah, three if you questions. don't mind. Um, well, the first question, of course, as you said, money is very important. So I'm just curious how the project has been funded from what kind of foundation or government or whatever. Yeah. And the second question, of course, is how sustainable the project would be. Um, you know, you're talking about the short of money. So can the project be continued? Uh, and the final question is a bit controversial, maybe. Um, as you said, there's a lot of work, and you, you didn't get much sleep, and you put a lot of work for it, and as well as many other scholars. So my question is then, why do it? And what's the impetus for doing this huge project. I ask this because I remember it was a Chinese scholar went to the British Museum many years ago and he wanted to look at some of the items kept in the British Museum and he was refused. So in the old days there was the idea of the ownership of those materials being some kind of culture capital as set by Bordeaux that should be kept by the individuals or the organizations. So why now, and you and your colleagues would like to change the mind and to provide an open access to everybody? You Thank you. answered your own question, the third one. But anyway, one and two, how are we funded? By anyone I can find. It's a mixture of funding. We have a mixed model. Um, so oh, you name it, we've had funding from them over the years, but having been going since 1993, 1994, it's um, a long time. How sustainable? Well, that's why we've always set up IDP centres in either libraries, museums or research stable institutions. And that we've always set up centre. So IDP in the British Library is a curatorial section of the British Library. So the British Library has a responsibility of looking after its digital data. The IDP in the National Library is part of the rare book section and they have responsibilities. So we've always set up IDP not as a separate institution or a separate group but within organisations which we feel will um, take seriously the responsibility of looking after and sustaining um, at least the data and the website because that's part of their remit. Uh, why? Um, well, I mean, the first reason why is that I'm a scholar and I wanted to use this material. Um, and I think, you know, it's like writing a book. You write the book that isn't out there that you want to read. Um, if you want to do it, then other people want to do it. Um, and I hope that attitudes have changed. I mean, of course, we have many, many scholars coming to the British Library and the British Museum, well, the British Library reading rooms, reading the manuscripts. It's still possible to get access to... Um, the physical manuscripts, and I think the attitude of um, not allowing access has changed a lot in our institutions over the past 10 years. Not in all institutions, of course. Um, we still struggle to work with India, and any of you who have good links with the government of India or the National Museum of India, that would be a nice, well, it's a tough nut to crack, but on the whole, attitudes have changed a lot. So um, I think for Dunhuang, with dispersed, fragile, unique material in collections worldwide, there was a very good case for digitization. And in fact, uh, online, I've got a, um, somewhere on the site a, a, um, a paper called The Perils of Digitization and arguing very much against digitization, except in exceptional cases. And I, I still think there's, there's that argument, you have to make the case for digitization rather than just do it. But I think for Dunhuang, for this material, there was a very, very good case to be made. You've got the microphone. I'm, I'm going to sort of continue in a different vein the question I asked before. And this is really out of my own ignorance. We look at the Palimpsest project, the Archimedes 
documents, all made totally public, data and all. The Dead Sea Scrolls, all out there, data and all. Walters, the Walters Museum puts out all their uh, Islamic manuscripts out there. Princeton, MIT puts their courses out there. Help me understand what you perceive to be the arguments against putting things out there and where people feel that the value is not better to put them out there than to hold them in reserve. Uh, sorry, I haven't made any arguments against. All my arguments have been No, no, but it, 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 no, it, it sounds not like you're encountering uh, uh, I issues of public access. Or maybe I misunderstood. Uh, we're encountering issues of public access, yes. yes. There have been issues of public access because people, I think misguidedly, institutions feel, one, there's money to be made from ownership of digital objects. I think that's, um, I, I, I think that's a fallacy in most cases for this material. Um, they think um, that it might challenge their brand or their identity. Um, and there's also issues with this material, for example, there used to be, and there continues to be, I would say, in India, an issue of fear of um, being too public with this material because of restitution issues and hiding it away. Now, I, th I would argue exactly the opposite. If you've got material which might be open to restitution, you want to show that you're looking after it and using it and making it accessible. But colleagues worldwide haven't necessarily always thought that. They've thought that it might be better to hide it away and not do anything and not let anybody see it. So, I mean, I don't subscribe to any of those arguments. But fear, you know, fear and... Um, why do scholars assert intellectual property rights so strongly in their work? I mean, as a scholar, I believe all my work could be done by some other scholar. All my ideas could be thought by some other scholar. Once I put them out there, they're everybody's work. They're not mine. But, you know, the scholarly community is very concerned about IPR. It's, it's the same impetus, I would say. Uh, Susan, could you share some thoughts? I've heard about this resourcing issue and, and it's characterized in terms of money. And at the same time, you've mentioned in your closing remarks how important it is to have people who love the work to continue it. In some cases, we talk about building ecosystems and, and having volunteers. Could you share your thoughts on how you're attempting to, to develop the next generation who will actually do this as a labor of love and, and get, I guess, build more interest in your in the work itself? Um, yeah, it would be, I think it's a nice thought that um, the next generation would do it as a labour of love. I would say next generation will be like this generation. A small part of them will do it as a labour of love. A lot of part of them will want a salary and funding and, um, you know, um, I mean, we do, we have a lot of educational projects. We work a lot with school kids in um, the UK worldwide and in China. Um, we also encourage a system of, um, of volunteers, so we have a lot of volunteers um, working with us, but that often creates more work than it, uh, for us than it actually generates. So it is, uh, I think if you're a big institution, you can absorb volunteers and perhaps use them um, to, 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 to create value. If you're a very small team, Actually, taking volunteers is very, very difficult. But simply by putting this material out, by speaking about it, by making it accessible, I hope that we're encouraging a, another generation to come along and want to learn about it and want to be involved. And I, I should say, we've recently just heard about two projects that are, one of them actually um, working with Tsinghua between French and Chinese French project to work on doing um, character, pun, pattern recognition so you can recognize fine characters on all the manuscripts and they will do a whole interface and um, uh, project for us over three years and that's very nice that comes I think as a result of just putting this material out and making it accessible so I would say just being enthusiastic and putting it out there <laughs> uh, one of the things that you um you described, but you didn't really um, um, feature uh, heavily as a as a as a as a benefit of this. I think is the bringing together, bringing back together a body of material that's been 
split up. Mm. And of course, we all know um, the, in the museum and the heritage world, we, we, as a profession over the last 200 years, we have been splitting stuff up and spreading it around the world. Um, I was involved in a project which you're presumably aware of, where with digitization of Jane manuscripts with the British Museum and others. And actually, the process of collecting these things has actually taken these assets away from the people to whom they're most important and has split them up. And it strikes me that one of the most important things about this kind of initiative is precisely the ability to provide that kind of virtual reunification uh, and, to, and to find new ways of providing access to people mm. whose material it actually is. Um, and I wonder whether, and one of the things that's most interesting about this your project is, is how you start with a particular site, but you, you find yourself expanding throughout the, the Silk Road. And I wonder whether you're finding new opportunities for new connections through, through digitizing the material in this way. Um. In a short answer, because we all need to go to lunch, yes, <laughs> just slightly long. I mean, the Dunhuang Library Cave, what we'd very much like to do is a sort of, um, you know, reconstruction of this cave. We have quite a lot of information about how it was done, um, what manuscripts were together and everything, and it'd be great to do something once we've finished digitising, put them all together and reproduce the cave like this, and be able to pull out and see the manuscripts alongside each other. But, um, yeah. There's lots and lots of new opportunities for um, this with, with all the data we work with. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.